After last week's shocking and head scratching ending, it is once again time for Black Clover. So without wasting any time, let's jump right into what is sure to be a very interesting chapter of Black Clover. Things kick off with what looks to be a brief breakdown of Julius, or should I say Lucius, Zogratus. After three months of theories being thrown all over the place regarding Julius and Lucius' true identity, it is finally revealed to us on the first page of the chapter, and I am happy to say that Julius is not a traitor to the Clover Kingdom. During the hiatus, many fans came to the conclusion that Julius may have been a knowing or unknowing traitor to the Clover Kingdom. Thankfully, this isn't the case, and the Wizard King we've come to know and love is still the same old magic fanatic as before. What we do learn on this info-filled page is that Lucius was actually born with two souls, thus creating the two identities we know today. However, this strikes me as odd, because if they were truly two separate souls, similar to William and Patri, why do the two souls share a grimoire? The two souls should have two separate magic types and grimoires, but now that it has been mentioned, we have never seen the true magic of Julius or Lucius, as they only have ever used Astaroth's time magic. I believe there is much more to be told here with the whole Lucius-Julius situation. It may not be as simple as two souls in one body, but let's keep on moving. We learn more about Lucius in his past life as he sits and watches his siblings, mentioning that amongst his siblings and throughout the history of his family, he is the most talented devil host. This tells us two things. Lucius is powerful, something that has been obvious to us from his very first menacing appearance. But what's interesting is that Lucius says he is the strongest devil host in his family's history, which could mean similar to Nott's family, the Zogratis have been making deals with devils for generations, something we might see more of later on. After briefly getting a glance at Lucius in what looks to be a summoning room of sorts, he briefly talked about why he decided to accept Astaroth and become his host. It's interesting to get some info and backstory behind the until now hidden Zogratis sibling. With that said, the next panel immediately rips the attention away because we get to see a full conversation between the two souls inhabiting Lucius' body and maybe even a little more. In the darkness, we have Lucius' speech to Julius explaining some sort of master plan, telling his body sharing roommate that he has seen the future and also seen true peace in that future. Putting him in the light, we have Julius, who is left speechless about how to respond, knowing that whatever Lucius has planned is wrong. However, this doesn't phase the darker of the souls, as he says himself, Ah, I also foresaw you attempting to stop me. How unfortunate. You, the one closest to me, even you cannot understand. With all this talk about foreshadowing and seeing into the future, it makes me wonder, can Lucius actually look into the future? If he truly could, then why haven't we seen it used more often? There are still so many questions to be answered regarding Lucius and his magic, and even his relationship with Julius and Astaroth. But it seems Sabata may have answered one big question in this chapter. As we see in the next few panels during their discussion, Lucius reaches up and points at Julius and does something. What exactly that is, we aren't so sure yet, but seeing as how both Julius and Lucius look young in these panels, this could be an enchantment of sorts that Lucius placed on his fellow soul to make him forget about him before sending Julius into the Clover Kingdom. Whatever he did seems to fit well into Lucius' master plan, because in the last few words of the page, he can be seen saying, It's alright, Julius. I've seen everything. And again, just below that, I will bring peace to this world. And with that, the three pages of the backstory we got come to an end, and we start right off where chapter 332 left us. But before we get into that, be sure to subscribe to the channel with notifications on to never miss an upload, and smash the like button for some plot armor today. Standing in front of Asta is none other than Lucius himself. After a brief pause and what looks to be a moment of confusion, Noelle pops her head out from her spying on Asta's spot and shouts out that it is the Wizard King. Asta, feeling that something is wrong, asks the strangely dressed man who exactly is, to which Lucius responds by opening his grimoire and stopping time around them. Flowing with anti-magic, Asta is able to break free and move away while also taking in what just happened. Looking around, it is clear that time has stopped for the entire area surrounding the castle. Asta notes that this magic is just like the Wizard King's magic, only it has been jacked up to 11. Without giving our poor hero a single moment to comprehend what is going on, Lucius drops bombshell after bombshell of information on Asta. He tells him that he has taken in Lucifero, confirming to us readers what we saw in the last chapter when he was munching on that devil's heart. Although we understand what's happening, Asta is so confused as to what on earth is happening right now. You're Julius, but you're not Julius. You're a human, but you're not a human. So who are you? We fully get it, Asta. I mean, just take a look at what happened to us fans when the Lucius reveal first dropped. Lucius slightly alleviates Asta's confusion by announcing himself to the hero. Lucius Zogratis. In his words, the savior of this world. This statement, along with what he said before, makes me question something. 
this man truly see the future in a possible way of creating an equal world through wrong means, or is Astaroth just manipulating him and showing him only what he wants his host to see? We could go on and on about questions and theories about Lucius, but alas, we'll just have to sit tight and wait to see what Tabata has planned for the character. After revealing his identity, the Spade Kingdom mage drops yet another bombshell on our protagonist. Julius is dead. Or so he says. Lucius could just be saying this to get a reaction out of his opponent, but from this statement alone, we simply can't tell. If Lucius's goal was to anger and get a reaction out of his opponent, it worked very well as Asta could not believe what he just heard. Eyes large would shock as he says, the Wizard King is dead? Lucius says something quite interesting in response, saying that Julius was on a mission for the sake of our ideals. It could just be wording, but this alongside the enchantment we saw earlier points to Julius being under some sort of mind wipe or control from his darker side. And after all that questioning in the last chapter as to what exactly Lucius's true plan is, the villain explains the whole thing, or at least the main gist of it right here. You see, Lucius wants true peace and although twisted, he believes that this plan of his is the only way to achieve it. A plan to fix all of mankind through killing them. Lucius wants to destroy all of mankind so he can remake them with the magic of his siblings. This actually makes a lot of sense when you take a look at it, ignoring the magic they gained from their respective devils, the Dark Triad all had a magic trait related to the body. Starting with Zenon, he had bone magic, Vanaka had blood magic, and lastly, of course, Dante had body magic. Everything matched up except for one thing, a body needs a soul, and I think it is safe to assume that Lucius will deliver on that front. I mean, from birth, he has been dealing with souls. This chapter already confirmed he was born with two, and we have also confirmed that we have never seen his magic in action, so it is not too absurd of a guess. Lucius goes on to promise that his new civilization will be made happy and equal. To make sure nothing goes wrong with this new world, he will watch over them as the final wizard king. Which, I mean, is pretty hypocritical because if you're ruling over them, everyone is not equal. Asta, who's still not 100% following what the hell is happening, shows confusion to which Lucius responds that he needs not to worry, he has already seen everything play out. Everything except for one detail, Asta. As shown in the Spade Kingdom and again, what looks to be the case here, Asta and Libe's strange non-magical circumstance and anti-magic are the one thing that pose any issue to the villain. As Lucius goes on to say, Asta is a flaw. Which is to say that not even the ever-informed Lucius or Gratis is aware of what exactly caused the phenomenon of Asa being born without magic. Which I presume is bound to be a major reveal from this arc. Now this Asa understands, I mean how could he not, he's been dealing with this his entire life. In typical Asa fashion, he responds full of vigor as he yells at his opponent. In Asa's eyes, Lucius is just a bad guy who's taken over the Wizard King's body. A bad guy he must now defeat. Asa even calls out the stupidity of Lucius's plan, calling it a load of crap. The Wizard King risked his life to save the world, and now in nearly the same body, Lucius plans to destroy it. Asa won't have it. Clinging on to hope much like us readers, our hot-blooded hero yells out that the Wizard King is not dead. The Wizard King that he and the world admire so much would never die so easily. And to prove it, Asa will defeat this phony and save him. Although his heart is in the right place, Asa is bound to go through some shock when he eventually learns the truth about Julius and Lucius. Without missing a beat, the villain displays a smug grin as he tells Asta that he is stronger than Julius. Being the show off that he is, the Black Bull's resident knucklehead powers up and breaks open Lucius' spell as he announces that right here, right now, he will surpass the Wizard King. Now it is important to know that this whole conversation between Asta and Lucius happened while time was frozen, meaning that only Asta knows that this isn't the Wizard King, but instead some shady person with dangerous plans. Interestingly, the others do not know this and may see Asa's sudden proclamation in a different light. I, for one, am very excited to see where Tabata goes with this, as there are a number of fascinating directions he could take. With that said, however, I will say that this chapter was pretty fast. This is the second chapter of the final arc, and so far, the villain's grand plan has already been revealed alongside some pretty large reveals. Then again, we have no clue what is planned for the future of the series, and we can see plot twists even greater than those that have been teased right now. And I'd like to think that if you're going this hard from the beginning, the rest of the arc is going to just blow our minds. But sadly, that is all for this week's chapter. Seeing as how Shonen Jump is on break next week, we won't be receiving a new chapter until the 20th, but that only gives us more time to theorize and drop some predictions. So be sure to drop some of your own theories down below. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching, and have an awesome day. I love you.